This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is July the 10th, 2015, and I'm conducting an interview with Joe DeAndrea in Manassas, Virginia at the American Legion. Joe, would you give us your full name, your date of birth, and where you were born? Okay, I, uh, my name is Joseph DeAndrea. Date of birth, November 12th, 1923. And I was born in New York City. And what war did you participate in? World War II. And do you have any veterans in your family? Yes. Well, not my immediate family. One cousin was in the Army Tank Corps in World War II. Uh, and my aunt married a gentleman in England. His name was Harold Hopper. He was a captain in the British Army, and he um, was in World War I, and he was gassed, and he died in a hospital in London. Do you remember where you were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yeah, I was riding with my dad down from the Adirondack Mountains in his 1935 Chevrolet whereupon the announcement came over the radio and my father said, oh, that'll be over in 30 days. How old were you at the time? I guess 18. When you heard that announcement and then after your father's comments, I take it you didn't put two and two together that you'd be involved with what happened? I didn't think so immediately because uh, uh, we figured, we just assumed that the regular army would do the whole job in as much as my father said 30 days. So I always listened to my father, but I shouldn't have listened to him then. So how did you enter into military service? How did you end up? Well, I went down to Grand Central Station and volunteered to join the U.S. Army Air Force. I wanted to be a mechanic. At least that's what I thought. And when I got home, my mother said, you're not going to go in the Air Force, son. Here's a draft notice. So I wound up being drafted. Went down to uh, the center and I had been given a letter from my employer because I worked on the Sperry Gyroscope M1 anti-aircraft director. So I was a little bit more technical oriented than most of the young kids. So they shunted me into the uh, U.S. Army Ordnance and I served in Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Maryland at the offset. So at what point did you realize you were going to be deployed overseas? Um, it was so great at Aberdeen, it was like a vacation, studying all the guns and the ordnance, and we didn't even think about it. And I was there about three months. They sent me to Army Range Finder School and Army Height Finder School. And uh, one day they said, fall in. We got our barracks bags. And we loaded on a Baltimore and Ohio passenger train with all the window windows painted black. And when we got off the train, we were in Norfolk, Virginia at the pier. So I knew it wasn't a cruise. What happened from there? Did you take a, a ship? There was no, no, uh, there was no, um, there was a gangway, but the gangway was all covered. Everything was covered. You couldn't see outside. At the time, it was reported that Norfolk was frequented by Nazi spies. So they couldn't see us and we couldn't see them. We boarded this ship. We went below deck, so we didn't see daylight until the ship was in the Atlantic. 
What ship were you on? Do you recall? The Sea Perch. It was a it was an merchant marine troop carrier. So explain to people um, what the living conditions were like on the ship and how long the voyage was. Well, the voyage was there were twelve ships. It took us ten days to cross the ocean. Of course, one day we were doing north, going due north. Another day we were headed west and east, and the ships would all turn in unison when a horn was blown. We were seasick most of the time, and we lived on saltines. We told the merchant marine guy that we were very fortunate to have that 90 millimeter gun on the stern. And he said, we couldn't hit the side of a barn if we wanted to, so don't get too comfortable. So are you, um, how many guys, you in bunks, I assume? How, how many, how high are the bunks? Uh, you guys the bunks, I, I believe there were three high. And we, our captain never got out of the bunk. He was sick. Most of us were on, on deck. Some were vomiting, but we were mostly seasick. Given the fact that we were most of the chaps were between 18 and 25. We took it in stride. What year was this? Not sure. 42, maybe, 43, 42. So what was your destination? Well, they gave us um, an army manual, and it was entitled, The Habits and Customs of the British People. So we were delighted. We were going to meet British people. They were like us, and we would be in London or someplace like that, and we'd meet some young ladies. And whereupon, 10 or 12 days later, we saw the Rock of Gibraltar. So we knew that was a ruse to throw off whoever was watching. And uh, we landed in Mirs el Kabir, Tunisia. What unit are you assigned to at this point? At that time, I was in the 26th, 16th, 26th, 18th Technical Supervision Regiment. I was still in the Ordnance Department. But uh, I was to repair the aircraft, anti aircraft directors. But at that juncture, the Germans were swept from the sky. There were no aircraft, enemy aircraft anymore. Uh, Rommel's army was chased by the, I believe it was the first army and the British second army into e Eastwood. They were in full retreat. So there was no need for aircraft, anti-aircraft gunfire or directors. And at that point, uh, we did a lot of idle time until we boarded ships for Italy. Take us, take us through your uh, progression then in Italy. When we went in Italy, uh, I was still in a replacement depot. I guess we were in regiments we could have gone to any part of the army. And uh, we were, I, we, I believe at that time we were all put into the infantry. And we were moving up, suddenly we got orders to go south again. We went to Naples, <clears throat> Naples, Italy, and boarded a British troop ship called the Samaria. The Samaria was a World War I troop ship, and it was British, and it smelled, smelled of mutton. Of mutton? Mutton. 
They drank, they ate a lot of mutton. We, when we landed in southern France, the war was a little bit north of us. And of course, the D-Day landing was already taking place in Normandy in the north. But when we got off the ship, there was no gangway. So they lowered cargo nets and we climbed down on cargo, cargo, cargo nets. And you had to step down at a given pace or you'd be stepped on. At that time, we got some happy news that the Americans had blown up all the German poison gas factories. We were carrying bandolier ammo, mess kit, rifle, pack, helmet, and a gas mask, which is a big flat contraption. And they were being abandoned in the Mediterranean. They floated like dead fish. Everybody threw them up overboard. Whether that was official or not, I have no idea. So where, where, do you, where um, are you assigned? At this point, were you assigned I'm to I'm in southern France, and southern uh, I'm in a, uh, it, 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 my memory fails me. I was in a, uh, still in a replacement depot. And uh, we moved up to Dijon, Dijon, France, and the ruins were unbelievable. The buildings were caved in. We, our major found a place to stay, and we stayed in a convent, an abandoned, burned out convent. And uh, with some planks and so on, the engineers uh, managed to get a roof on the place. We then, I, I think at that point, just after that, I was assigned to the Company A of the 298th Infantry Battalion of the 75th Infantry Division. And uh, I remember going into the Netherlands and into Belgium. We were fortunately on the periphery of any hostile fire. But one day, we heard this loud humming sound off in the distance. And it got louder and closer and closer. And then we looked up and the heavens were filled with B-17 flying fortresses and P-51 fighter planes. I would estimate there were between four and 500 aircraft. They blackened the sky. They were all going east toward Germany. We traveled mostly, or going back a little bit, the only danger we faced in Italy was riding on the mountain roads with no guardrails in Dodge troop carriers on the edges of mountain roads. And the young drivers did not drive slowly. They drove at a pace now that would be considered dangerous. So that was one danger we faced. Uh, what were your daily duties at this point? They were so mixed. My, my parents wanted to ask me what I was doing. And I said, uh, well, if you ever saw Radar in MASH, the company clerk, I was running around doing various chores. One of the chores I had was 
to uh, assemble a line of troops and pass out, I don't know how to spell it, halazone tablets, which were to purify water. So, uh, and I remember once I was, I'm not sure what came first. Once I drove an ammunition truck, it was really not, it was sort of out of control. You know, it was like people knew what to do. We didn't need too many orders. I drove an ammunition truck and I drove a water tender once. I remember running into a couple of bedraggled German troops who had their hands on their heads and were very delightful, delighted to see us. One fellow, this is long after the fighting was way east of here. I have no idea where they came from. They were uh, so great to see us. And uh, I look at some of the World War II films and you see the German troops and they're resplendent with their uniforms. These fellows had burlap shoes. They had, their clothes were all tattered. One fellow said he was 35 years old and had been drafted like seven years before that. And they were looking for food. We also ran into a small encampment of people behind barbed wire. As best I can remember, they were clergymen, ministers, priests, nuns, and uh, There was another group, but they were, they hadn't eaten in days. So we were instructed not to feed them because our food was too rich. The quartermaster took care of them. Yeah. As you were, as you were um, advancing into Europe, what were your living conditions like? In other words, what Well, you they were mixed. What, oh, I told you we lived in a convent, a burned out convent. That was pretty good. Uh, sometimes we lived in a pyramidal tents. I guess they took 12. And other times we slept on the ground, on a fender of a six by six Dodge troop carrier. Uh, we also traveled quite a bit on French freight cars. In World War I, they were called 40 and 8s, 40 troops and 8 horses. We used to be just 80 people. The last person in, it was hard to find a place to lay down. It wasn't a good condition, and it wasn't pleasant, uh, but we were all young, so we took it in stride. Did your uh, company see any combat at all? Uh, only on the periphery. We could always hear the guns. We could always hear the fire. I imagine over the years I wondered what was flying they were probably V1 German rockets and V2s on their way to England. And maybe they passed over our heads. I, I'm not, I don't know. How did you stay in, well, let me back up. Were you uh, married at the time? No. How did you keep in touch with your, uh, your folks back home? Well, uh, there was a thing called V-mail. I don't know if you know about that. They were little short things. They. And I kept telling my parents that I was very happy living in this hotel in Paris. I told them nothing. My parents were very worried. 
on the little amount of downtime that you had, what did you and your buddies do to keep um, entertained or busy? One guy was very proficient at juggling bayonets. We watched this idiot quite a bit. We, uh, we attempted to uh, play softball a couple of times, but that was short-lived because uh, we were alerted to something, we don't know what, and we had to go in the get on the ground, but nothing ever happened. What about radio? Did you have access to uh, We had these radio? big, you saw my cell phone, it's a little tiny thing. We had a, I would say, two foot high cell phones that w sometimes worked, sometimes didn't. And you, I didn't carry one. <coughs> the captain had it. <coughs> would you be able to receive English radio stations on these big radios? What's that? Oh, no. We couldn't, there was some short wave, but I don't remember ever knowing what was going on. We only knew that, uh, well, I in particular was very gratified that General Eisenhower proclaimed that anyone who served in two, two theaters could go home. So my stay in Tunisia qualified me. So then they had to assign you to an outfit. And I was assigned to the, just for a matter of identification, I was assigned to a artillery company. And we went to uh, a port, Cherbourg, I guess, and came back to the United States. You mentioned um, going through these towns, Cherbourg and all these other towns, and I'm sure you rolled through. Can you describe what the, the, these towns look like? We were in one place called Romond, R-O-E-R-M-O-N-D, Holland, where I have a picture of myself standing on a pile of bricks. And a native resident once told me that that was a four-story apartment house. The buildings were just shells, miles and miles through France and northern France, Belgium and Holland. The buildings were devastated. I did have one assignment, and I, I'm not sure whether it was, my memory's failing me, whether it was in Africa or southern France, where a German fighter plane had apparently uh, strafed this building, corrugated roof building. So we were, we had to repair it because we wanted to, the Army wanted to put ordnance in this building and it was leaking. So we had to improvise and someone come up with the idea of tar and patches of canvas. So we spent days in the hot sun putting these patches on the holes in the roof, in the corrugation. We thought that was fun. The, um, the French, did they treat you well as liberators? Oh, yes. Yes, the little contact we had. Oh, I remember one incident where we were in an attic, uh, in a barn, up in the hayloft, sleeping one night. I can't tell you exactly when or where, but it was someplace in France, and we saw a canteen cup of a private who was in World War I hanging from the rafters. And the Frenchman, as we got out of the barn, the Frenchman said, they were here, you're here, and your sons will come here. That's all I can remember. So um, how far did you end up progressing? At the end of the war, where were you at that point? 
or had you already got your points? Oh, I had my points, and I got back, and I was in. I met my parents, and my brother and sister, in uh, Grand Central Station, in New York City, and the army gave us. Two dollars and thirty-five cents for transportation because we landed in Staten Island. If you know the direct the geography there, we had to get across on the ferry and take a subway train to Grand Central, which was our ultimate destination. I I remember that the subway. Uh, Entrance was five cents, and the Staten Island ferry was fifty cents. So I really made money on that deal. <laughs> when when did you um, when did you leave Europe? What, what, what this would have been in early '45 or you, leave? When when did you come home? Uh, March of nineteen February nineteen forty six. So when you heard that the, the war was over, how did that make you feel? Well, we only knew the war was over in Europe. It was still on in Japan because some of the outfits that didn't come back here, fortunate like myself, that didn't get on a ship and come back, were on their way to, to I don't know, maybe Okinawa or someplace, Japan. Some of those guys were in the infantry outfits in Japan. But that war soon ended, too. Everybody treated us splendidly. The French treated us great. The Germans treated us great. They were happy the war was over, too. How do you think that your experience in the war shaped your life? Well, it enlightened me to such that I, I'm very depressed with the, the absolute lackadaisical attitude of the Americans who live in a complacent atmosphere and think it can never happen again. It's all around me, including people my age, but mostly younger people. It also depresses me to learn that people, college-bred people, do not know founding fathers or the Constitution. It mystifies me. Um, this video here, you're going to get a copy of it, and a copy of it at the Library of Congress. So in theory, a couple hundred years from now, one of your great, great, great grandkids might watch it. What would you want them to know about your, your service in the war? Well, I'm now a great, we have a great, great granddaughter. Um, I don't. I don't mostly talk about it. The funniest thing that happened to me, one of my grandsons said, were you in the big war, granddaddy? I'm quoting now. I said, yes, I was. He says, did you shoot anybody? I said, I don't know. He said, when was that? I said, Matthew, that was in the 1940s. Whereupon he said, did you know Abraham Lincoln? Kids have no conception. I need to go back a bit. Before we started the interview, you mentioned that you had a bayonet, bayonet wound. Tell us about that. You got your oh, got the bayonet. I was trying to show. I'm not sure whether it was my buddies or some French mademoiselle how thoroughly trained we are with bayonets. And I thought it was a beer can, but it was a sea ration can. So
So I went to open the can with the bayonet. Hence, I got this wound. You mentioned also that you had run into a, a, a nurse. Yeah, I ran into a lady at Wegmans down in uh, Manassas. And she saw this hat I'm wearing today and said, were you in World War II? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, so was I. So I only knew of Army Wax, Women's Army Corps. So I couldn't fathom how she would be in the Army. But she said, what outfit were you in? And I told her the outfit. She said, so was I, that outfit, which totally mystified me, whereupon I learned that she was a army captain nurse and she had taken care of the wound on my finger. She was from some place in the deep south where she lived and she was up here to visit her grandchildren. Small world. Are there any other stories that you wanted to document on the video? Not really. I, uh, I was very happy to serve. I'm not so sure many people are. Many civilians are. Uh, I just learned that the Army is going to be cut by 40,000 next year, which kind of mystifies me and I don't know if it's budget cut or it's just plain politics, which is not very pleasant in either case. Well, on behalf of the Americans in Wartime Museum and personally, I thank you for your service and I thank you for coming in today to tell us your story. Well, I'm certainly delighted and uh, I think the work you folks are doing is admirable, and I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it.